Hey everybody, it's Alex, Old Man Badly, and we're uh, we're going to take another kick at this right to repair thing. Uh, mostly because um, Lewis Rossman put out a couple of uh, short videos this week um, that leave me scratching my head about, is this the arguments that you really want to make? Old Man Playing Video Games Badly. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Alex back with you for some more of this good fun about right to repair. Two things. First of all, I greatly support right to repair. And you can see my videos up here somewhere. The little eye in the corner and whatever comes with it. Um, that I really do support the right to repair. I just think that uh, it's got to kind of mesh up with the rest of the universe it can't be um it can't be open-ended um the uh the process by which right to repair is being pushed right now um sounds a lot like the people who push uh first amendment rights that they basically feel that they can ignore everybody else's first amendment rights because they have first amendment rights <laughs> um Things work better when they mesh together. You know, we're, we're right to repair and liability and, and warranty laws and, and all sorts of things have to go together to make it work. Right to repair cannot be an absolute. And this video is called Right to Repair. Are those the arguments you really want to make? And the star of this show, where is he here? Is Lewis Rossman. I really like Lewis Rossman. Lewis Rossman uh, runs a business in New York City repairing MacBooks, uh, amongst other things, but mostly MacBooks, laptops, things like that. And um, Lewis has also ended up being a semi de facto leader of the right to repair movement, at least um, on the side of the microelectronics world, although he's 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 uh, radically branching, as they say, but that's okay. Uh, Lewis is a great guy. He's uh, really quite intelligent. Um, he, he has some blind spots. We all do. Um, and um, the whole process of right to repair, I think, has kind of over-empowered him to start asking some questions that are just... You really want to make this argument? I don't, don't get it. So let's uh, start with the obvious and work our way along. Uh, this is called an important question. Citing safety concerns, Apple and Microsoft believe that you should not be granted the right to repair your device. If that's the case, then why do they then grant the responsibility of assembling them to children in China? A good 12 second video. I'll, I'll comment on it later. But I just wanted to say that this is the uh, kind of false equivalency argument that's a lot of fun to deal with. And as you'll see in the next video, he does something else that's pretty common and is a very poor way to make an argument. Let's, uh, let's switch over to video number two here. And uh, it's, I'm sorry, it's a vertical video. I... Uh, I, I apologize ahead of time. I dislike vertical videos, but I guess somebody got TikTok. Many lobbyists are telling lawmakers that right to repair is a radical idea. So I'd like to show you two different ways of doing business, and you tell me which one you think is radical, which one you think is a dystopian future, and which one just makes sense. Here, somebody that owns a product that costs $2,000 is asking the company that makes a $5 chip for that product whether or not they can buy it. And when you scroll down, you'll see that the manufacturer of that $2,000 laptop tells the chip company that they're not allowed to sell it to anybody else, so they are forced to pay $1,500 going back to the manufacturer to have it fixed. Here, somebody wants to know the size of a thermal pad so that they could fix a $1,000 graphics card that they own, and they are told that not only would this void the warranty, which is illegal, but they're also told that the dimensions to that part are confidential and that they can't know it. In our second example, you have someone asking if there is an alternative part for a part that is in their device. Not only are they told all the details of the part, but they are even given a schematic so that they know everything about how that device that they own work. Which future do you want to live in? 
Ah, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Lewis. Lewis has a skill in a sense of presenting things in a way that, that um, he goes through them fast enough that unless you're paying attention, you don't have time to think. And humans by nature want to do this. They want to believe the person talking to them is intelligent and they want to believe they're right. Um, plenty of people do this sort of thing. I speak quickly, but I tend to pause between things. So what triggered me on this particular video, what got me started down this road, road is that Lewis starts out with a very simple supposition, but the supposition itself is total crap. Are you ready? Many lobbyists are right there. Many lobbyists. If, if you follow politics, you know that um, the current Biden White House has press conferences every day and the press ask various questions. And uh, of course, those those media who've chosen to be the loyal opposition to the Biden administration ask those stacked or loaded questions. And a, a Fox News reporter recently did that, um, saying that many people, blah, 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 blah. And the press lady, sorry, I just moved something was underneath my mouse pad, driving me mental. Um, the uh, press lady, um, Jen Pataki, I think it is. Anyway, um, asked the reporter, well, which people? And it went back and forth and, and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And finally, I came down to it wasn't some people or a lot of people. It was one Republican senator who dislikes Biden. So the question was kind of pointless. When Lewis says many lobbyists, he should cite something. He should say lobbyists such as Bob Smith from ABC Company said, because then that actually says something. But when you say many lobbyists, that's the basis of a straw man argument. You're setting it up so you can knock it down so people believe that you've done something when in reality you haven't. Now, the two examples he gives, um, firstly, the chip. Now, I've talked about this before, but I'm going to hit this again one more time because it is super, super important. If a company makes a chip and does not sell it at retail, they make the chip at the behest of an individual company and they produce this chip, perhaps using a combination of their own uh, designs and designs provided to them or purchased from them by this company. Those parts are not available at retail, period. That company is not going to sell you those things. That's the nature of the game. They have an exclusive arrangement with, I believe in that case, it was Sony. And it is an agreement with Sony. And if Sony doesn't want to sell the part, take it up with Sony. But if you're going to try to take it up with the company that makes the stuff, you are going to get absolutely nowhere because a company who makes them exclusively for Sony is not going to throw out millions of dollars of contracts just to make Bob Smith, who wants one freaking chip, happy. Nor can they be obliged to sell it. It's not even theirs to sell. Contractually, I bet you they're in fact ordered not to sell it as part of the contract. So it's a, a complete straw man argument because you're asking the wrong person or the wrong company. If you want the part, ask Sony. If you have a problem with Sony not wanting to sell you a part, we can have a discussion. But when you go back to their suppliers and hassle their suppliers and their suppliers are contractually obligated not to sell the parts because the part was made exclusively for Sony, straw man argument you can't force them to do what the contract says they're not allowed to do period the second one with the thermal pads um, first of all if you've gotten to the point of taking your graphics card apart to the point of needing to replace the thermal pads there is potential that you will be voiding the warranty if the thermal pads are not reinstalled properly 
or anything else has happened, the potential is yes, the warranty could be voided if you tried to get service on it later. If you brought that card for an RMA and they open it up and discover that the thermal pads inside are not the original thermal pads, the company that made the card would well be well within their rights to say, sorry, we can't support the card because it's been modified. Again, companies are under no obligation to provide this information to you. If you want to open the card up and you want to make the change, get out your little micrometer, measure the thickness of the pad, and replace it, and good luck to you. Don't blame them for not wanting to open themselves up to more problems. It is confidential. They have no reason to disclose it. They have no reason to disclose it because they have no reason to disclose it to their competitors either. So... You know, again, it is a big straw man argument. If you really want to know how big the pads are, measure them. Finally, the third item on the list is the um, the welder. And I'll see if we can boom our way up to the welder over here. Hang on. In our second example, you have someone asking if there is an alternative part for a part that is in their device. Okay, now, first of all, a part in their device. Now, we've gone from microelectronics, okay, on one end, to an industrial welder. And the component in question is a thermistor, which is basically a temperature-controlled um, resistor. Uh, I'm trying to get a thermal resistor, basically. It is a very, very, very standard part, okay? It is mass-produced and used in millions and millions of components. Um, and the Miller part, 20696, I believe it is, is just a part that Miller had a company crank out by the bucket load. But there's no mystery to the part. You can actually go online and you can look up the details of the part for what it's worth. Um, it's not a big deal. Now, Miller could, if they so desire, say we have no interest in that. You know, we have no interest in providing information. They did. Good on them. Now, you notice that they're providing alternative part numbers. Well, the alternative part numbers, if installed, would no longer be the original parts. And, of course, it would be very easy at that point for Miller to say, well, we don't have any more warranty on that device because you've changed an important part in a thermistor in a welder apparently is a fairly important part all considered. The other part that isn't talked about here, of course, is the age of the devices in question. The first chip is for a brand new PS5 controller. The second example um, is from a brand new graphics card. So a a current current model graphics card. Um, one that would only have been released in the last year, um, which would normally absolutely be under warranty. The PS5 controller would be absolutely under warranty. The Miller Welder? Mm, I don't know. Um, honestly, if they're having to go look for parts uh, past a certain period of time, well, perhaps it's um, not as new as all that, right? Um, because after all, a Miller dealer would normally would have most of the normal parts and life would be good. So we're left with the question of false equivalency again. So now... Are these the arguments you want to make? Do you want to equate brand new equipment, exclusively built components, exclusively built custom components, or um, thermal pads, which by definition, no end user should be anywhere near, to the insides of an industrial welder? The other question that we don't have at the end of the day with all of this is Stephen L. Ryan, the guy who wrote the email to the company, is Stephen L. Ryan, as an example, an electrician? 
Don't know. Without context, the questions are kind of strange. And as I said, are these the arguments you want to make? It would be much, much wiser, I think, for Lewis and the right to repair brigade to say, hey, we have these products that are falling out of warranty. Your iPhone 11 has a two year warranty on it and it's now out of warranty and we would like to be able to fix it. So when a, something goes out of warranty, we would like the parts to be more widely available and things like circuit diagrams and stuff made available so that repairs can be made by any competent technician. That'd be a, a much more useful argument. It would be a much better starting point, in my opinion. Saying that we have this brand new Sony PS5 and somebody's man managed to mangle up a controller already and we want all of the details and complete access to purchase directly all of the secret sauce components that make a PS5 a PS5 because right to repair, you, you fail. You just, you fail. It's not, it's not in the company's interest. It's not in the consumer's interest because I'll tell you the other part of it is if companies are obligated to basically disclose their secret sauce on brand new products, they're either going to not want to make as many new products or they're going to want to make the new products as absolutely complex as possible to make repair as difficult as possible. Or they're just going to say, that's fine. We're just going to charge you 50% more for it because we have to make our money up front because everybody will just clone our products 10 minutes later and we'll be done. The chip in question, the ISL 9240, is a secret sauce chip on the controller that does everything from receiving the signals from the movement controllers, and I believe it also does the USB charging, the USB data transfer, and perhaps even has something to do with the unique high-speed wireless uh, mega low latency connection that is used uh, with these controllers. It is literally the secret sauce of the PS5. Um, video games live and die by the quality of their controllers and the secret sauce to make those controllers as good as they are is a a worthy secret for a company want to, to want to keep as long as they can obviously other companies will duplicate and already have duplicated um appearance and or some of the functionality of a ps5 controller but without access to that direct part they're having to create their own versions of it which may or may not be as good that's one of those things um, if they want to make copies they want to make copies should we absolutely obligate sony and or the companies they contract to retail one at a time parts to consumers i don't know it seems odd seems like a very weird way to do things um which brings up i guess the other argument for all of the right to repair stuff which is right to repair would work best if the people pushing it got together and made sure that they were licensed, that they were trained, that they were certified, that they were insured and had, you know, liability coverage and whatnot for the work that they do in a consistent manner so that the consumers could say, I will repair my device at an approved shop. And a company like Sony can say, we will only sell components to a licensed retailer. All of a sudden, right to repair can function a lot better. But when it's, you know, Bob Smith calls up and wants a chip, who knows? Who knows what Bob Smith is doing to it? Is Bob Smith going to use that chip to, you know, to fix a PS5? Or is he going to build something else and compete with Sony somewhere else? Who knows? Certainly the company that made the chip is under absolutely no obligation to sell a chip. And it's such a straw man argument to go after them. It's such a stupid argument. And, um, you know, like I said, I love Lewis. I think Lewis is a great guy. 
but it's a dumb argument because you're arguing with the wrong people. You know, it's like going to the going to a farm and asking the farmer why he can't sell you a steak. It's not his part of the business. That's not what he does. Leave him alone. As for the security issues and making phones in China with children. That's the other thing that I will always object to, which is I'm absolutely against child labor and all that comes with it and blah, 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 blah. Okay. I mean, it's, it's the obvious stuff, but at the same time, companies like Apple and companies like everybody else, you know, every other company in the world that outsources the building of their products or the assembly of their products, no company save maybe Intel. No, not even. I don't even think Intel makes their own substrate. I think they get them from somebody else. But anyway, most companies are not vertically integrated for all of their products. They have companies making their cases. They have companies that make the resistors, the capacitors, uh, the chips, etc. And what they're doing is they're specifying the chips, they're creating the chips, they're deciding which parts they're putting together and they're giving them to a company like a Foxconn um, or similar and saying, hey, assemble, you know, two and a half million of these in a week. And a company like Foxconn goes out and finds the workers and gets the job done. All through that process, besides Foxconn, there's there's hundreds or thousands of suppliers and sub suppliers and sub 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 providers. And some of those will cut corners and some of them will do it the wrong way and some of them will cheat and some of them will lie and some of them will unfortunately use child labor. Some of them will use uh, forced labor. Some of them will will make people work 14 hours a day. Companies like Apple can do the best they can in dealing with Foxconn or whoever their, their uh, builders are and try to get them, you know, put them in a position where they must and regularly inspect the facilities and do that. But the reality is that a lot of the materials used to build modern electronics are mined in places all over the world in China and Africa and whatnot. And in many of those places, children are part of the workforce. It's not nice or happy. It is a reality. And there is absolutely, utterly no way to stop it. Because it's so far, there's no way, there's, a, there's no way for Apple to easily stop it because it's so far down the food chain and so far down the, the stacks of, uh, you know, assemblers and, and builders and, blah, 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 blah. and you get all the way down here and there's, there's, yeah, there's a child laborer working a dirt shit job, ha hauling bags of dirt out of a mine in Africa in the rain and make blah, 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 blah. Okay. We all know that we've all seen the videos. We all know. We can try our hardest, but at the same time, in applying the Western standards of life, let's remember something. The child laborers are laboring for a reason, and the reason is to have your cheap electronics. The reason why your iPhone is $1,000 instead of $2,000 is because all the way down the line from the top to the bottom, components are sourced for the best price and somewhere along the line when you do that you're going to hit people who are going to obtain the best price in ways that you're not going to be exactly comfortable with and if a company like apple says well no we're only going to you know we're going to a to z that everybody everybody involved in the process from a to z from from dirt to device is going to be an adult working of their free will at all times no more than eight hours a day and being paid an equivalent western minimum wage 
Your phone's going to be 5,000 bucks. That's just reality. So the argument of, you know, oh yes, and they assemble it, but you know what? I understand the argument and the argument is valid in a, in a, um, in a snooty Western we're superior to you kind of a way. But in the case of right to repair, is this really the arguments you want to be making? I hate the idea of child labor. I understand why it exists. If you really want to end child labor, you have to fix the entire, um, like the entire thing, like I said, from dirt to device, you'd have to go all the way down to the end and go to the, you know, these, there's places in Africa where people are making, you know, a hundred dollars us a year. Their kids don't go to school. As soon as a kid's strong enough to carry a bag, he's carrying a bag because if you can go from a hundred to 110 a year, fuck, your family's rich by comparison. Okay. That's the sad reality. So if you're, um, if your suppliers are not paying enough for the components and not charging you enough for the components and you're coming down and saying, no, we need the components at a better price. That's what's going to happen. And the thing is, it's not Apple doing that. It's you and me. When I look at a, a graphics card and I say $300 is too much. The reality are there are components on that board and I know it and you know it that have some kind of involvement with forced labor or child labor. It is a fact of life. And the web camera I'm using and the lights I'm using and the microphone I'm talking on and everything else probably has the same issue. The true issues are inequality and the true, you know, the true issues is, is the difference between the very rich Western countries and the very poor rest of the world. And the rest of the world is more than willing to do the job any way possible to make the money. We're the ones dictating the terms. So again, if this is the argument for right to repair, it's going to be a hard sell. Companies like Apple and Sony and all those guys will more than gladly follow along. If everybody gets forced to do it that way, they'll gladly follow along with you and sell you $2,000 or $3,000 phones and $5,000 laptops and $10,000 whatevers. But you won't want to pay for them and you won't want to buy them and you won't be able to afford them. And then you'll bitch and moan and whine and complain and tell them to lower their prices. So just remember, when you ask about child labor, when you ask about all these things, the source really is you. All right. Thanks very much for watching. And, uh, you know, give me your feedback. Um, like I said, I support the ideas of right to repair. Don't, don't ever get me wrong. Um, I think we should be able to fix our devices within reason. Uh, but honestly, microelectronics um, at this point has reached a level where it is complicated to service. Um, it's not like, uh, not like me changing, uh, changing a capacitor in a tube amplifier 40 years ago, um, by unsoldering two big leads and sticking a big component in and soldering them back in. You saw Lewis is working with, um, uh, he's, he's working with microscopes and you watch his videos and you can see his hands. It looks like his hands are shaking. His hands aren't moving hardly at all. They look like they're shaking because the components are so damn small and you know, more power to him for being able to do it. Um, I would love for there to be lots of certified, trained, well-insured, responsible technicians to repair older electronics, um, to give older devices, new life. Um, I think it's wonderful, but 
you know, right to repair, talking about brand new products and products that have just made it onto the market and asking to have all the parts laid out in front of them for essentially cheap retail price. It's a hard, hard argument to make. Anyway, as I said, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Uh, leave your comments below. Um, I'm always in for a good discussion on this stuff. Right to repair is super, super important. But there's limits to everything. So thanks. And uh, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, uh, thumbs up, all that stuff. Um, comments and thumbs up help the whole bunch to let uh, YouTube know that you like the stuff and that more people should see my videos because, well, I would appreciate it. Thanks much. Old man playing video games. Bad.